Hi. Um, good morning. Uh, it's a great honour to be here, actually. It's very, uh, I was uh, delighted to be part of this in a small way. Um, I think this is the most important thing in airway management that we've, uh, that certainly in this country we've been, uh, I've had the privilege to be involved with. Oops. How do you go back? Good. I need to mention that uh, I've received non rerum from the Laryngeal Mask Company and have helped to design the, um, the AP Advance. Great. Let's crack on. Um, <laughs> now, uh, I thought um, we've only got uh, 12 minutes or so, so um, uh, I'm going to go through numbers first and then go through some uh, actual examples. Uh, this is really interesting. Numerical analysis, we heard about this earlier. Seven, sad, superglossy airway devices, 56% of all UK general anaesthetics. That's actually probably a bit lower than I thought. I thought it was going to be 60, 70%, but there we are. That's the true number. That's important. Um, now, of those, 90% are what are called classic laryngeal mask airways. So that's the ones that Dr. Brain invented. Or another term is laryngeal masks, which are the other types of these uh, first generation devices. Um, and then there are some second generation devices, which account for 10% of all the supraglottic airway use, um, and they're really the IGLs, ProSeals, and, and, and other devices as well. Now, in terms of the um, supraglottic airway devices that um, uh, patients that, uh, that use them, that presented to the NAP4, there were 34 cases where this, uh, a SAD was the primary airway. Uh, and of those, 17 were aspiration related. I'm not going to talk about the aspir aspiration related ones because uh, Dr. Cook's going to talk about that later. Of the non-aspiration events, there were two deaths, five emergency surgical airways, 13 ICU admissions. That doesn't add up to uh, the right number because obviously some have, uh, have, have both, uh, both of those factors. The deaths. Uh, one was loss of airway in the semi-prone position during prolonged surgery in a patient with a predicted difficult airway. One death, sad. Second one, poor laryngeal mask positioning, loss of airway and unrecognised esophageal intubation during response to this event. That's... Uh, uh, we're not sure. That could be classified as a sad event or it could be that put the tube down the wrong hole. Let's look at uh, the numbers in specifically. So the non-aspiration events, 16 <coughs> reported cases. Now this is interesting. Of the non-aspiration events, most were in youngish people. 10 out of the 16 were less than 40. They were mostly healthy uh, and uh, 7 of the 16 were in urgent procedures. So the majority were in non-urgent procedures. M a, a large number of this group of non-aspiration problems were obese and that's compared to a much lower number of obesity outside of this group. So obese patients, young, healthy, uh, 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 are having these non-aspiration problems with superglottic airways. Um, and uh, also interesting, none of the patients who aspirated during use of a superglottic airway device weighed more than um, 100 kilograms. This is looking at outcome and quality of airway management. This is interesting for a number of things. It tells us, uh, this is uh, uh, what the review panel thought, what were the factors, causal, uh, whether it was it patient-related, education, training, judgment. And you can see the non-aspiration <laughs> issues and the aspiration issues. Uh, if we go on to look at um, what, what was judged to be the quality of the airway management, it's interesting because um, you would, uh, the, the aspiration events, the quality of the airway management isn't, uh, regarded as quite as bad as the non-aspiration events. So it's the non-aspiration events that have poor quality of airway management in young people uh, having uh, routine things done. Um, what about the devices used? Well, this is quite m murky actually because uh, it appears that, that many, many anaesthetists aren't entirely sure of what uh, superglottic airways they're using and so when the data is coming back some of the terminology isn't quite right um, so uh, you know they might start off with saying uh, a classic laryngeal mask and then it might become a laryngeal mask which might become something else so th 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 there's, some, there's some confusion there um, but it appears that uh, uh, these are the non-aspiration events and these are the aspiration events interesting here again there seems to be this disposable single-use devices there seems to be uh, slightly more non-aspiration events than aspiration events, uh, w w which, is, uh, which is interesting. So, 
What, uh, what, what this, um, this whole project has been really useful for, as I think uh, Dr. Cook mentioned earlier, not so much that a lot of this is new, but it's the first time you can put numbers on this thing and add themes. So what's really interesting is when you, when you see a report and you think, well, actually, that could have happened to me. But then you see it again and again and again, and then that becomes quite powerful. You can, you can develop some themes. And the sorts of themes that, were developed from, that have been developed from the superlative airway devices are uh, in relation to uh, 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 perhaps... Uh, uh, problems in terms of patient selection, um, perhaps uh, 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 expanding its use to where they shouldn't be used, uh, understanding the limits of, uh, of any chosen superlotic airway device, uh, experience, training, um, perhaps use of second generation devices, problems during maintenance, problems at emergence and recovery. Let's go through these individually. Um, uh, you can all read. Uh, so, uh, elderly ASA3 patient with diabetes, controlled gastroesophageal reflux disease, presented for repair of an irreducible, irreducible abdominal hernia. Patient had bowel sounds and normal bowel action. Patient was anaesthetized by a consultant anaesthetist with a laryngeal mask, doesn't specify which one, for airway management. During maintenance, the patient aspirated, causing airway obstruction. The patient was intubated. At the end of surgery, the patient was extubated, but deteriorated and required re-intubation in ICU admission. Further deterioration in ICU was rapid and the patient died the same day. So, patient selection. Limitation of use to appropriate surgery. Elderly patient, severe abscess, uh, septic, dehydrated, and somebody's decided to do a rapid sequence induction. Somebody's gone off because it's lunch and uh, 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 the second anaesthetist judged that the rapid sequence induction was not indicated. Following induction, LMA was inserted. Uh, from the transfer from the anaesthetic room to the operating theatre, patient regurgitated, aspirated, uh, required intubation, and subsequently went to uh, ITU. Inexperience. This is a really interesting one. Morbidly obese, middle-aged patient, otherwise well, re uh, operation requiring lithotomy, uh, 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 requiring lithotomy position. Um, Preoperative assessment showed reduced neck movements and limited view of the soft palate. Out of hours, performed by a first-year specialist trainee. Pre-oxygenated, ventilation was possible uh, through uh, the airway seal, although the airway seal was poor, and some carbon dioxide was expired. Patient was transferred with that possibly uh, uh, inadequate um, uh, laryngeal mask um, to the operating room, where the saturations fell again, more induction agent was given, uh, laryngeal mask was repositioned without any improvement, mm -hmm. it was removed, bag mask ventilation started, um, uh, muscle relaxant was given, still weren't able to ventilate, intubation was attempted, larynx was vis visualised. After intubation, ventilation remained difficult, hypoxia persisted, patient entered cardiac arrest and capnography showed minimal expired CO2. Despite prolonged resuscitation attempts, the patient died. Inexperience and insertion. Young, obese patient, trainee, out of hours, minor uh, surgery in the lithotomy position. Single use laryngeal mask was inserted, loss of consciousness, ventilation not possible. May more induction agent, change to a face mask, ventilation remains impossible. Uh, hypoxia develops, consultant comes by, um, uh, patient was intubated and surgery completed, ended up in ITU. Inexperience and insertion. Maintenance. Following placement of a single-use LMA by a very junior anaesthetist for minor surgery, the patient developed laryngeal spasm intraoperatively with complete airway obstruction and hypoxia. Delay before intubation, following which persistent hypoxia and post-operative pulmonary edema necessitated ICU admissions. Some of these we have heard of, I'm sure. Uh, emergence, recovery and removal. There's a theme. It goes, starts off at the beginning of not preparing, not assessing adequately. Then we use the device, which may or may not be appropriate, in a patient that may or may not be appropriate. We then have a problem either in induction, uh, in maintenance or through to emergence recovery or removal. Uh, senior anaesthetic trainee, morbidly obese patient, asthma, minor surgery, wants to use a disposable laryngeal mask. The reporter indicates that this was chosen instead of an eye gel to protect the patient's at-risk dental work. Uh, in recovery, the patient bit, obstructed the laryngeal mask stem leading to hypoxia, uh, where of course we should all be using bite blocks. Laryngeal mask was forcibly removed, patient developed profound hypoxia, post-operative pulmonary edema and required ICU admission. So this is just a, a snippet of, of examples that illustrate where things are, uh, are perhaps not going as well as they could. So these themes are, are, are very real and it's been very useful seeing um, the, these reports to, to illustrate all of that. Recommendations. Um, firstly, laryngeal mask anaesthesia is a fundamental skill 
it's, it's, as we know, it's not just simply pick it up, push it in, put some air in, and off we go. Uh, there is, it should have the same attention to detail as intubation. It's a, at one level a very simplistic device, but at another level it requires skill, attention, understanding of the device. So patient selection, indications, contraindications, insertion, confirming correct position and maintenance. They're all fundamental core skills that, uh, that, uh, that, that, sh that we should all have. Um, uh, it was, um, it was, uh, there were reports where, um, where a patient was known to have a very difficult, be a difficult airway, be a very difficult intubation, and therefore a supraglottic airway device was chosen for the procedure. Um, and, and it was thought that maybe in those circumstances you should consider doing an awake fibre optic or fibre optic through the SAD, because when that airway device becomes a problem in a known difficult intubation patient, then things really spiral, spiral downwards. Difficult or failed SAD placement should raise the possibility of complications during maintenance, emergency and recovery. And that's really talking about um, uh, 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 this and this are related. They're talking about uh, putting in a device that isn't quite right. There's a bit of a seal. It's not quite right. The airway pressures are very high and just carrying on with it rather than regrouping and trying to get the, uh, the optimal device for that patient. Um, Recovery staff competent with uh, supraglottic airway device <coughs> procedures and timing of removal. Absolutely, it's just as important uh, for that whole process to take uh, uh, for, 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 for the use of, uh, of a supraglottic airway. Taking it out at the wrong time, um, taking it out without <coughs> adequate bite blocks, patients biting down on it, they're all, the, 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 all of these things have been reported. Um, if tracheal intubation is not considered to be indicated, but there is some small increased concern about regurgitation risk, a second generation supraglottic airway device is a more logical choice than a first generation one. Um, uh, uh, and I think that's absolutely right. Um, where the 90% of the supraglottic airways that we use are first generation devices from over 20 years ago. Things have moved on, but perhaps we haven't quite uh, always. Factors that mean use of SADs at the limits of normality, prone airway access size. Consider Jack's second generation supraglottic airway device. Same, exactly the same uh, 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 rationale. Uh, and all hospitals should have second generation supraglottic airways available for both routine use and rescue airway management because we recognise that there may be some advantages to those second generation devices. Um, good, eight minutes. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs>